There's a character that I always want to talk about that was, uh, I was always interested to know who is the false prophet. There are so many videos about this guy is the Antichrist, that guy is the Antichrist, but then I never heard anything about the false prophet. So it always intrigued me and I always want to know. Uh, there's not a lot of people talking about that. So I thought that I would be one of the fir uh, first people who could talk about the false prophet. Now there are a few Bible believers that I know of who, could, who talk about the false prophet and it's some interesting things. Uh, and I thought that I'd give my two cents about that one. Now, common teaching is that a lot of people uh, are wondering and they believe that the false prophet, that he is the Pope, uh, which is a very strong candidate, I can see that, because they need a religious leader, a religious leader for people to look up to during the time of the crisis and the New World Order system. However, I believe differently. I do not think that it's the Pope. I really believe that the Pope will be uh, the Antichrist instead. Now, I know that uh, what a lot of people are going to say that, well, the Antichrist is more of a political, secular figure rather than a religious figure. And the Pope is most looked up to in the world. Well, that's a good point. However, if you look at Revelation chapter 13, and I've given that commentary in Revelation 13, but I'm not going to go too much into that right now, uh, because I'm going to basically give an expose on who the false prophet is. So I'm not going to do a little bit of a defense on why the Pope is the Antichrist, because that's not the subject of today. What I'm going to point out, however is that if you look at Revelation 13, both the false prophet and Antichrist, they both have religious and secular power. There is absolutely no doubt about that. From what I view it and the way I see it, I see it as both. I see it as both having uh, religious as well as secular power. So then what is the false prophet? Who is he? So then, just using a little bit of common sense, you just compare scripture with scripture, right? Isn't that the common sense method? So then you go by scripture with scripture, and then you can find out the identity of this false prophet. And all you have to do then is with scripture with scripture, look up the word false prophet. That's the point. You got to look up the word false prophet. So go to first, uh, we're going to look at uh, two chapters. They are going to be second Peter chapter two, second Peter chapter two as well as Revelation chapter 13. Now, what you want to know is this. If you want to find out the identity of the false prophet, this is what I believe. I believe that to find the identity of the false prophet is going to be found in these two chapters mainly. They're going to be 2 Peter chapter 2, as well as Revelation 13. You might say, why is that, Pastor? Because, uh, first of all, Revelation 13 talks about the activity of the, anti uh, of the false prophet and more than any other uh, book that you can, or chapter you can find. And then 2 Peter chapter 2, why we know we can attribute this to the false prophet is because the book of 2 Peter is a tribulation epistle. That is so important. That's why we are Bible-believing dispensationalists. Amen. If you believe general epistles have application to the tribulation, and not just the Christian church, but tribulation, then this will be eye-opening for you. But there are people who deny the general epistles to apply to the tribulation, and that's why they're going to miss a lot of gold mine and doctrine. How do we know that the book of Peter is about tribulation? Simple. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 3. Knowing this verse, that there shall come in the what? Last, Last day, scoffers. So notice that Peter is talking about tribulation, end times. But look at chapter 2, verse 1. Look at the language here. <coughs> chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even, look at this, as there shall be false teachers among you. So it's like a future tense. So notice false prophet is mentioned as 2 Peter chapter 2. But it's a plural form. There's going to be plural false prophets. Why? Because look at the book of Mark. Keep your hand at 2 Peter though. Go to Mark chapter 13. 
We're going to go to Mark chapter 13. Now notice what the Bible says, what's going to happen in the tribulation at verse 22. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. Notice that it's a plural form of false prophets. Even though we think one antichrist, one false prophet, the Bible says there is a plural form. There is a plural form. Look at Mark chapter 13, verse 22. For false Christ, see, the antichrist, and false what? Prophets shall rise. Notice the context of verse 14, that's the tribulation, is it not? Verse 14. So notice here that if we go back to 2 Peter chapter 2, we can see that this can apply to the tribulation. Applying this timeline to the tribulation, then let's take uh, some several things into account about the tribulation, about what the timeline is like with the false prophet, what kind of man he is. The first thing you want to know about the false prophet that I notice about him is that he is definitely, now I'm going to lose a lot of followers on this one, once they got egged into this and they're like, ooh, I want to know this teaching, they're going to now cut me off after this one, is that he is like a typical famous pastor today. That is very important. A good example, and I always mention this and people hate me for saying this, but I'm going to say it again. One of the greatest examples who was close to this was Billy Graham. Yeah. Yeah. Billy Graham. Why? Because think about it. Think of a pastor who was had ties with all kinds of secular leaders and governments. Billy Graham is the man. He was there. He was at the invitations of the presidents being inaugurated. Uh, during his funeral, several, all, several presidents were there including the ones where we tied to the globalists and skull and bones and etc. So Billy Graham was definitely the man who had such power. And he was a great speaker. All the liberal news media talked about Billy Graham being a great pastor and etc. Why? Because he can speak well. Look at what the Bible says at verse 3. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make mer merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. So notice that they can talk really well. So he is a tip, uh, he's, all, he's a false prophet. So if he's a false prophet, then he has to be a typical pastor. Also look at verse mm, 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity... They alert through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. So notice here that he has to be a, a great pastor. Uh, he can speak very well. And by the way, I really believe this, is that he's going to have to be a famous, I'm going to put quote-unquote Christian pastor. You might say, wow, you carry it that far? Yes, because look at 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2. Notice that at verse 20, that they used to be in the Christian fold. They're part of the Christian group, but they're not really saved. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. See, they have knowledge of Christianity. They are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. But look at verse 21, that's scary. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. So he's going to come from the Christian group, whatever this quote Christian group is. But it's down so far that it's going to include he's very charismatic. And I don't mean just charisma. Those charismatic groups, religions, they're very charismatic people too. You might say, oh, you're going really too far. I unsubscribe. Well, then you can miss out the blessing that you're going to hear from the Word of God. And perhaps some warning, because this is a good warning sign to you. Yeah, amen, Pastor. So go to the book of Revelation chapter 13 and Mark 13. Look what the false prophet does. He does miracles. Verse 13. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Notice that he's able to work miracles. Go to Mark 13. 
Mark chapter 13. Think of a Christian group that believes in doing miracles, charismatics. And do they have ties to political leaders and uh, governments and powers too? Great example is Benny Hinn. They say that Benny Hinn, after Billy Graham, Benny Hinn's the one who draws in the crowds. There's a saying about that. So see, that type of man is very, very powerful through these healings. Benny Hinn, he recently, uh, no, a couple of years ago, he renounced the prosperity gospel because of his corruption. Because of his corruption. Now, maybe his repentance is genuine, sincere. I don't know. That's between him and God. But the point is, is that his reputation and his ministry shows, up, shows that if there's a guy like him who can have secular ties and such powerful ties, just like Billy Graham did, then you just combine that with a little bit of charismatic miracles, it's very possible you can get that later in the future. Mark chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says at verse 22. For false Christ and false prophets shall rise and shall show what? Signs and wonders to seduce, if it were possible, even the what? The elect. That's how scary it is. It's so scary that it's close to being Christian. See that? It is so close to being Christian. Oh, I don't know if it's so, so possible that you can have a uh, Christian pastor tied to a secular leader. No, I mean, think about... Now, you're going to hate me for saying this, okay? But Trump is a great example. Now, I know that Trump, the Lord used him in a lot of other things and stuff like that. But think about it. He had Paula White a charismatic female preacher who believed speaking in tongues. And they, these, don't tell me those pastors were not politically affiliated. They were die hard into Trump. But think of a lot of charismatic pastors today who are speaking for Trump yeah, and saying that you have to be on God's side yeah. and they're doing the miracles to do that. Now, this is scary. If, you, if this can be done with Trump and deceive that many Christians... And they're thinking they're the ones against the globalism? Imagine when this guy comes to the scene and can pretend that I'm against the Antichrist government and get all these charismatic preachers into his side. Now, I'm not saying that Trump is the Antichrist or you, uh, anything like that. I know the Lord used it on some things, but I'm showing you the danger here. Yeah. The danger is that it's through Trump, even if you want to dub him as good guy and a lot of good things he did, it was possible through those feats, those quote-unquote good deeds, that bunch of Christian pastors joined his side. So why not when the devil has his man later on? And not only that, he's just he has to be this. Remember that. He has to be this. He can't be full-blown evil. He has to be something like this. Let that sink in your mind. Let's, uh... And by the way, if you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, they do this to make merchandise of you through speech. How many have taken advantage by saying, I have a vision that Trump is going to win the election, and then through that speech, and making way, being a forerunner for their secular leader... They got money from the people. Mm -hmm. Why? The false prophet's going to do the same thing. Forerunning, being a forerunner for the Antichrist, ah. using words to deceive the masses and give me money for it. I mean, if that's possible with uh, the de era of Trump, why not when the, the devil comes out with his man? It'll be much easier for him. Oh, the Christians aren't that stupid. If it were possible to deceive even the elect, it's that tricky that it can deceive God's people. It can't be stupid, all right? All right? Let's, uh, I, I vote for Joe Biden and everyone looks at Biden. I mean, look how capable that guy is. I mean, no one's stupid enough to go for that. But when you do something, when you disguise as really Christian, you can get the person. Anyways, going back to second, uh, Revelation 13. Here's this. So we see that he's going to be very charismatic. Uh, Billy Graham's a great example. That's why the Pope is a great example, because the Pope you see that he has ties pushing the liberal socialism agenda, actually. So he makes a very good candidate for that. But why is it, Pastor, you don't put the Pope here? He can fit really well over here. Well, uh, you can put the Pope here, but there is something that really bugs me about it, is that I mentioned to you before, I believe that the Pope fits more of the Antichrist bill. Yeah. 
then uh, where are you going to put the false prophet? He's going to be from a Christian type of background, and he's going to speak very well with the people. I mean, you can see that the Pope is nowhere near that then. The Pope, Catholicism is like a totally messed up religion. But think about this. Catholicism is being close, very close to Christianity. You might say, why? Because of this group here. This group here undoubtedly paved the way where Catholicism is mistakenly thought as being Christian. <laughs> Evidence is Benny Hinn. If you look at Benny Hinn, he was defending the Catholic Church and some of the Catholic teachings. Didn't you know that? Look it up if you don't believe me. A lot of the stuff that he did, he was uh, <laughs> defending some of the Catholic teachings. And he had priests on there too, Catholic wow. priests. He, and he was uh, bashing the Orthodox Church. <laughs> you wonder why, right? See, it's all that political history we studied in discipleship. But aside from that, see, it's very possible. Now, what do I think about the false prophet? First of all, notice that if you look at verse 14, I believe this, that the false prophet, he's going to come from a Christian background, but he can't be the Pope. I really believe that he is going to be a Muslim prophet. Now, in this teaching, I just want to give a disclaimer to the people, all right? What I'm teaching to you is not going to be 100% infallible doctrine. All this is something that I've digged up and studied and researched for myself, and then you guys uh, make a decision. Because the false prophet, the Bible doesn't give uh, so much specifics about him. So I'm just digging what I can and then giving you what I know. So a lot of this is just new information from me, okay? But I thought that this would be a good start for you guys to launch ahead and then do, dig your own research. Why do I think he's a Muslim prophet? Because uh, first of all, we look at verse 14. So we see that the false pro uh, he is known uh, as the false prophet, right? Prophet. Now, the Muslims, for some of you who don't know about it, they make a big deal on not the representative of Christ. They're making a big deal about a prophet, Muhammad. That's the reason why. One, that's why Antichrist fits better with Pope. Why? Because the Pope is the representative of Christ on earth. That's why. So he fits with Antichrist, and then the false prophet fits better with the Muslim prophet. But here's another thing. The... You have a teaching within Islam, which is very interesting, where they talk about the Mahdi, the Mahdi. And they talk about this Mahdi where he will rule for seven years in the end times. And that this Mahdi, he will be the one who will uh, defend and clear out the enemies and pave the way for it, the Muslims. So that's why a lot of people were seeing that this guy that the Muslims are looking forward to is the Antichrist. So then they see that the Antichrist is more of a Muslim figure. However, I see the Antichrist as more as Catholic, and that will be a totally separate subject. But here's something they don't teach you, and they forgot to teach you. It is true that the Mahdi, that he will rule for seven years, however, he needs help. Uh, because he's going through a battle at the end times. And then some Muslim scholars, they mention that during this time where the Mahdi is at a, a pickle, to try to regain Jerusalem for himself, he's going to get the help of Jesus. Jesus is going to come back and help him conquer the enemies. So then they teach that the Mahdi and Jesus together will take back what? Jerusalem, the dome for itself, and they'll be able to rule. Now, here's the thing about Muslims, is that the Muslims, they believe that the Mahdi... Okay, if we can attribute the Mahdi, anti, uh, the Mahdi to the Antichrist, I can do that because the Antichrist is a conglomeration of all religions. So I see him as primarily Catholic, but he's going to be ecumenical. So then you have to match up with Islam, Buddhism, all other religions somewhere. But the Muslims are looking forward to this Mahdi, right? And then they say Jesus is also going to be ruling alongside him. Here's the thing. They don't believe Jesus is God. 
but they believe him to be a what? Prophet. So then, think about what the devil's going to do. Then if we can put the Mahdi as the Antichrist, and then the false prophet, they're going to see as, this is what we talked about, where the prophet, like Jesus, would come down, or Jesus himself is the prophet coming down to help the Mahdi, and then they rule together. Wow. Now, let me show you even more interesting things. Another interesting thing, why I see Islam all over here, is notice that he mentions at verse, uh, uh, let's see, the Bible mentions about the false prophet, at verse 15, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. What prophet did a lot of killing yeah. mm -hmm. to convert the people? And what kind of killing? Did you read Revelation 20? Yeah. Beheading. Did you read the Quran? Wow, what prophet did that about beheading? I mean, and they value the prophet in their religion. The one that they value uh, as God's person speaking for God is not the Pope their look, or some kind of Christ. It's prophet. That's the Muslims. How about that? And not only that. If you look at verse 10, he that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here's the patience and the faith of the saints. It's done by a sword. Wow, so then this false prophet has a sword. I mean, I mean, isn't it pretty plain over there after that? It's pretty plain over there. I see a lot of Islam over here. I see a lot of Islam. But let's look at other instances. Another instance is if you look at verse 16. He causeth all. So the false prophet is the one enforcing the people, small and great, rich and poor, free and pawn, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. So this false prophet is forcing people to take a mark, right? Mm -hmm. So he's forcing everyone to take a mark, six, six, six. Now, I don't know if some of you knew this, but this is kind of crazy. If you look up in, if you look up in the Greek manuscripts where our King James Bible came from, it says 603 score and six, right? But if you have an interlinear Greek or a Greek New Testament and etc., look at that word 603 score and 6. And then you'll see certain Greek symbols there. Yeah. Now, if you don't believe me, you can simply Google it. All right? Mm -hmm. You can simply Google the Arabic symbols, their letters. And it's called in the name of Allah. And when you look up the Arabic wording about in the name of Allah and compare the inscription letters of those, guess what it matches almost to a T? Yeah. The Greek words for 666. Six, six. Wow. Didn't you know that? If you don't believe me, you can Google it right now. You can Google it right now and compare the Greek, uh, how they worded 603 score and 6, and look at those symbols, and look at that Arabic inscription in the name of Allah, and look how close those things are. It is so scary. It is so scary. But see that, which prophet is enforcing his religion and then his mark as well. So he's enforcing the mark. It's the false prophet, notice, that's enforcing the mark at verse 16 through 18. It's not the Antichrist. Yeah. The false prophet is doing this for the Antichrist. That's very interesting. So there's a lot of... Uh, Muslim indications. There's a lot of Muslim indications with the false prophet, which is intensely interesting. Some other things, and I'm sure we'll come to some uh, Muslim indications later on, but let's continue on about this false prophet. So then the question is this. Well, pastor, you, you said that he was Christian. Now you're saying his mu he's Muslim. This is too confusing and it doesn't make sense to me. No, in this day and age, it's not impossible, actually. 
It's very possible. Uh, there's a thing that's going around concerning about Bible prophecy, and this is the enemy to watch out for, and that's Chrislam. And Chrislam, what they're doing is that they try to reconcile elements of Christianity with Islam. Why? Because Jesus is a prophet to both of them. Jesus' words have authority to both of them. And then they believe in uh, one God as well. So then they try to find a lot of things that are similarly tied together. So when you look at Chrislam, I mean, it's a dangerous movement that's starting to rise. But just look at the Catholic Church and then the Muslim religious leaders. How often do they buddy-buddy with each other? Uh, the Abrahamic Accord and etc. You've heard about that? They're trying to build something where they would have a mosque and a synagogue and a Catholic place of worship together. So believe it or not. Why? Because they're tying everything together. So then, if you see Catholicism from here, who can join with the Muslims, and then you get these Christians who join with the Catholic Church, then where are you going to get? Give it about a couple more years, and I guarantee you this, we're already, ahead, we're already there now. Yeah. It is very possible you can get so-called Christian pastors who get to here. Why? Because Billy Graham made friends mm -hmm. with the Muslims. Billy Graham made friends mm -hmm. with the Catholic Church. Wow. How about that, huh? So it is possible. I really believe it's possible. So then how can it happen? Well, it could happen in this way. Let me look at Revelation 13. Now, I'm going to show you a really crazy theory here. Uh, the first part is this. Notice that at verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. Now, notice here that the false prophet, how does he come into the picture? Did you notice that? Some of you didn't notice that, right? So number four, how he came to the picture, is that it's possible he pops out of hell. How did he come? Look, read that verse. Where did he arise from? Out of the earth. It doesn't say that he was born as a man living amongst humans. He just came up out of the earth. Popped up out of hell. Is that possible, Pastor? Did you know about... Uh, you didn't read the Antichrist, did you? At verse Revelation 11, verse 7? <laughs> if you don't believe me, at Revelation 11, verse 7, the Antichrist is the one who comes up out of hell to approach the people. So why not the false prophet? Thought about that one? Here's another one. Let me stretch it even further now, all right? The Antichrist pops up out of hell because he's carrying the spirit of somebody. And that's Judas Iscariot. If the false prophet pops up out of hell, why would he do that? Maybe following what the Antichrist does because he's carrying a spirit with him. Why, who would it be then if not Judas Iscariot? Balaam. Oh, now, Pastor, go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. 2 Peter, chapter 3, 2 Peter, chapter 3, remember, uh, 2 Peter, chapter 2, excuse me, chapter 2, 2 Peter, chapter 2, right, the same context about the false prophet, yes, all right, what did the Bible say about these false prophets at verse 15, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following who? The way of Balaam, the son of Bozer, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Crazy, right? Will Balaam's doctrine have a part in end times? Well, Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation is a book about end times. What did God say? Revelation chapter 2 verse 14. Chapter 2 and verse 14. The Bible says... But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the who? Doctrine of Balaam. Wow. So, if this is true that the false prophet's going to come out of hell, perhaps he will carry the spirit of Balaam within him. Wow. Now, if he is popping out of hell with Balaam, this is even more interesting. 
you see something that connects with this guy. Go to 2 Peter, chapter 2. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Okay, look at verse 15, right? Balaam, right? Mm -hmm. But notice what the Bible describes about this prophet. This, this guy's a false prophet, right? Mm -hmm. But was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass, that's one, speaking with man's voice forbade the who? Madness. Madness of the prophet. Who's Islam's prized prophet that had an issue of what? Yeah. Madness. By the way, another one, what did I mention? The donkey speaking. Mm -hmm. Didn't you know, in, according to some Muslim sources, Muhammad had a donkey, and accordingly this yeah. donkey talked to him. Yeah. Oh, wow. And that was to the madness of the prophet. That, how about that? Isn't that uncanny? That's really weird stuff. <laughs> really weird stuff. Let me show you a, a bigger one. Go to Numbers 23. Numbers 23. So then it got me curious, where did Balaam come from? Numbers 23. <clears throat> we know that the Antichrist, his ethnicity and nationality is Syrian Jew. You all remember that? Yes. He is a Syrian Jew. Now when you look up Balaam, Balaam, he is not a Jew. He is not a Jew. That's why I mentioned to you before that the Antichrist that he has to have uh, ties with Muslim as well as Judaism in order to bring a peace treaty with those uh, two groups together, but it's obviously through Roman Catholic ties. Now, look at Numbers chapter 23, though. This is interesting. Numbers chapter 23. Look at verse 7. What did Balaam say? Balaam said at verse 7, and he took up his parable and said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from where? Aram. Aram, out of the mountains of the east, saying, come curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. You know, look up the word Aram in, uh, Google, and Google it. You know where, what they will attribute Aram as? Syria. They will attribute it Syrian. So this false prophet, just like the Antichrist, Syrian. So it shows once more about a what? Muslim connection. It once more shows a Muslim connection. Very interesting. But he's not a Jew. Why? Because, go to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. There is something that Jews will not do and they cannot worship images. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 13 verse 15. Revelation chapter 13 verse 15. And he had power to give life unto who? The image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. But Muslims can argue, no, we don't believe in images, so what are you talking about? Ha <laughs> they don't realize this, but their religion it comes from paganism. There is absolutely no doubt about it when you look at their culture. Allah comes from moon deities. But not only that, they got their kabah. And their Kaaba, it was a storehouse of hundreds of idols. And what do they all do? They all bow down to the Kaaba. And they say they don't worship idols. So guess what? They have, that's a question among Muslim apologists. Uh, I thought we don't believe in images and uh, worshiping them, so why do we bow down to the Kaaba? And then you just hear these people you know, explain why they bow down to the Kaaba. It's just funny. And we only do it for direction. It's only for direction. One south, one north, east, and oh, come on. I, I busted up laughing, one of these Muslim scholars, <laughs> talking like that. I was like, you just sound so silly. So we see here that he doesn't have Jewish ties, which is why he can carry out the Antichrist order on what? Let's kill those Jews. Why? Because the Muslims are waiting for that day where Jesus will join the Mahdi in getting back the Dome of the Rock and their territory in Israel. Wow, how about that, huh? Now, let's return to Revelation 13 once more. Revelation chapter 13 once more. 
A lot of interesting things about this false prophet. So then, what can I say? Well, what, can I, what I can say is this, is that there's a guy from Syria who converts to Christianity, which is some kind of Catholic form, and the charismatic churches are really reaching those people out there. And then this pat, when this guy becomes big and famous like a pastor, I mean, you don't realize this Benny Hinn, he, he was from Israel, you got to understand. So if something like that is possible with Benny Hinn, why not this false prophet eventually? So then this false prophet who comes from Syria and then gets converted in, to Christianity, but it has ties with Catholicism, but he wants to bring peace back with the people, you just carry on the political ties further, you can have Chrislam. See, it's not, it's not that much of a far-fetched theory. It's very possible. Because we have today's events paving the way for that. And we had previous preachers and prophets, etc., who carried on, who committed those similar actions. Another thing for some of you who don't know, but the Bible says concerning about Balaam that he did divination, divination, etc., so if he carried on some sort of divination, let's also look at the book of Revelation 19 now. Revelation chapter 19. <clears throat> We're going to look at uh, Revelation chapter 19. And then Numbers chapter 22. Numbers chapter 22. So we're going to go to Revelation 19 and Numbers chapter 22. There's no doubt that because he is committing these feats, that he's going to be connected to a cult. He will be also be connected to occult practices. Oh, how can you get that? Well, it's not, not a problem. Look at that. The charismatic signs, wonders, and visions. Mm -hmm. Do you know that occultists have been talking about those things a long time ago? These are alpha brainwave patterns and etc. A lot of it matches with the occult. The greatest evidence is Korea. Korea is a combination of pagan shamanism with uh, Pentecostal doctrine. And that's why Yonggi Cho's church became widespread on fire and he had the world's, the world's largest church. No other church topped his. Some of you who didn't know that. See, so it is possible to mix up paganism, something occultic, with the Christian doctrine. Why do you think I make a big deal about wrong doctrine in churches? There's not a big deal. No, it's a huge deal. Now, go to Revelation chapter 19. We're going to look at uh, chapter 16. Excuse me, chapter 16. Chapter 16. Notice at verse 13. Chapter 16, verse 13. Notice there's demonic uh, magic or power or occultic witchcraft that is within this false prophet. Revelation 16, 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So there are frogs spitting, uh, coming out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirit of what? Devils. Devils working miracles. Go to Numbers 22. Numbers 22. Did Balaam use divination? Yes. Verse 7. Numbers chapter 22, verse 7. Balaam used divination. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with, their, with the rewards of what? Divination in their hand, and they came unto Balaam. How about that? They sought Balaam's help for divination. Why? To curse the Jews. So there is a mingling of Satanism, occult practices, that is uh, behind the scenes of this false prophet. And a very interesting person that I looked up, David Blaine. Now, I don't know if his last name is spelled with the E at the end, but David Blaine, I don't know if you knew his uh, tricks, but his tricks, if you were to look at that as an endurance, uh, endurance ma magician who goes through endurance feats, it's absolutely insane. I mean, he's even baffling atheists, and atheists are wondering, how did you do that? That's insane. 
So when you look at that, you, you tell yourself, man, that guy's demonic. And when you look at him, he does look demonic too. No offense. But the way that he accomplishes these feats when you watch him do the tricks, it's so scary. But he, one of the tricks that he was able to accomplish, some of you who don't know, was able to uh, have frogs in, reside within his abdomen and he could spit it out. And he spit out not just one frog, but numerous frogs. And he scared all the Hollywood celebrities accomplishing that feat. An interesting thing was he fell out of a really tall building trying to accomplish some kind of trick and feat. And then when he came out, he claimed he had an epiphany or some kind of vision or, or some kind of feeling that all uh, nations and religions, etc., would be united as one. When I read that, I was like, am I reading that right? <laughs> that was scary. So we can see a lot of the things that the false prophet, so this is number five, excuse me. We can see a lot of things that the false prophet would match up to. Now, here's something else that's interesting, and we're going to close it here. Notice this animal. Yeah. That is what the false prophet is likened to. Now, go to the book of Revelation. Now, this is very important. Your King James Bible words something very carefully here that I want you to look at. Revelation chapter 13. <coughs> Excuse me. The false prophet, he is known as, at verse 11, he is typified as this, at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had what? Two horns. Two horns like a, what did your King James Bible say? Lamb. 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 All right, it did not say ram. It said lamb. That's very important. Now, it may be possible that it could be referring to a ram. So I'm giving you my theory again. This is all theoretical. But if I'm believing every word as it says, perhaps there's a deeper meaning. Because the Bible says lamb. Now, what did the Bible say? Go to the book of Matthew chapter, uh, chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. This again ties to a minister again. Why? Because God warned you at Matthew 7 verse 15. Beware of false prophets who are, uh, who are come to you in sheep, 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 sheep clothing. But inwardly are ravening wolves. That's why the Bible chose lamb. Didn't say ram. Because it wants to point you out, this is a sheep. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Beware of, look at that word, false prophets, which come to you in what? Sheep's clothing. That's why Revelation worded that. Wow. So then the question is, why would God put two horns on this lamb? Because it's a spiritual creature. Is that possible? Yes, Satan's copying catting someone. Revelation 5. Revelation 5. Did you read this in your King James Bible? Did you read this in your King James Bible? Look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. Such an animal is not possible. Well, it's a spiritual, supernatural creature. You're not looking at the right creature. Revelation chapter 5. Look at verse 6. And I beheld and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a what? Lamb, Jesus Christ, but this lamb, as it had been slain, having what? Seven horns and seven eyes. How about that? Imitating Jesus Christ. But here's something very important. It's not trying to particularly imitate Jesus Christ. He's trying to imitate someone else. Why? Because what we know is this. What we know is that Satan has his trinity in the tribulation. Yeah. That's the idea. And that is Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. Satan, symbol. Uh, a lot of Bible believers know this, Satan represents God the Father. Mm -hmm. The Antichrist represents God the Son, imitating Christ, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The false prophet is imitating what? Holy the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. So here's an unholy spirit. But it says lamb, pastor. Oh, keep reading. You don't read your Bible. Revelation chapter 5. Lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the what? Seven spirits of God. Holy Spirit. 
That's the Holy Spirit. So then that's why your King James Bible put horn with this lamb. That's why. Now, here's a question. Why is it two now? That's the question, right? Why is it two horns? Think about it. The Bible says that the dragon came out with all kinds of horns. Mm -hmm. Seven heads, ten horns. The Antichrist who comes out, uh, ten horns and ten kings. The false prophet, two horns. Why? What does two horns represent? Daniel chapter 8. <clears throat> Daniel chapter 8. And you thought Bible study was so boring. I just love to say that. Rub dirt on people who think the Bible is so boring. Daniel chapter 8. Look up. Look up every word in the Bible that talks about a horn. Look at the book of Daniel and Revelation. Revelation will mention the horns. What are the horns representing? It's a king and kingdom. That's why the dragon has his horns, which is representing seven kings and kingdoms. The Antichrist has ten horns, so that's representing ten kings and their kingdoms. The false prophet, he could it represent kingdoms in power? Why? It was it, the Lord, it, when he's speaking a revelation mindset, he sure prophesied that way. Verse 20. The ram which thou sawest, having what? Two horns are the who? Kings of Media and Persia. See, kings and kingdoms. How about that? How about that? Then the question is, why? Then uh, who are these kings and their kingdoms, right? What are they? Who is the devil going to use? This is where we close in a word of prayer and stop our Bible study, right? <laughs> Go to Revelation. Revelation 5. Now, this is theory now. This is completely theory. I'm going to give to you Revelation 5. What we can know is this. What we do know, it's a lamb with two horns. And then the closest matching reference you can get to that is a lamb with seven horns. That's closer than the ram at Daniel 8. But there's no doubt if you look up every verse in the Bible that talks about horns, it's representing a king and the kingdom. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Revelation 17 is so plain that it says the horns are kings. It goes that plain. So then we're like really wondering, okay, what kind of king and kingdom is this then? Well, here's the thing. The Bible says that the dragon and the Antichrist, with their kings and kingdoms, it had crowns on top of the horns. Crowns on top of the horns. But not the false prophet. Then what could it represent? Well, let's look at the closest reference. The lamb with two horns is closer than the ram itself. Look at the lamb. Verse, the last part of verse 6, a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, right? Mm -hmm. Who are these seven spirits of God? Go back to Revelation 1. Scripture with Scripture. Revelation chapter 1. Scripture with Scripture. A lot of people don't read the Bible. A lot of people don't read the Bible. Uh, but if you were to read the Bible, it would be so awesome. Verse 4. John to the who? Seven churches. Wait a minute. The lamb had seven horns, right? Mm -hmm. But keep reading. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the who? Seven, seven spirits which are before his throne. Do these seven spirits approach to these seven churches? Why? Yes, actually. If you remember your Revelation study. Yeah. Because Revelation chapter 2. Uh, the first church, right? Mm -hmm. And verse 7, there's your first spirit. Mm -hmm. The second church, Smyrna, verse 11, second spirit. Verse 12, Pergamos, third church. Verse 17, the spirit, so on and so forth. The seven spirits are speaking 
to these seven churches. And that's why John mentioned at verse 4, the seven churches, why? The seven spirits wow. are communicating. Why? Simple. It's not hard. to. Uh, why is that so hard to believe? Because the Holy Spirit is inside this church as well as all other churches, Bible-believing churches around the world. Amen. The Amen. Holy Spirit is in there. He's our comforter. He's our guide. He's, our for, uh, he's the one that exalts and is a forerunner to Jesus Christ. Amen. Wait a minute. So then this false prophet, his oh. job is to make way for the Antichrist, and he is supposed to be the guide, guidance, the comforter, and the speaker, the mouthpiece of the Antichrist, like the Holy Spirit, but his two powers, why not churches, religion? Then you think about, uh, ha, 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 you're all jumping ahead. Then you think about my theory, it may not be far-fetched yeah, after all. Wow, look at that. So then it's something, so then what? It can be something that's so-called Christianity and Islam. Why? Because these are the two largest religions in the world. How about that? So then, there's your unholy spirit. And that could be those two horns. It's what? Chrislam. It could be Chrislam. Continuing onwards, let's look at his, uh, his timing, his sequence, and then we'll close. His timing and his sequence, and then we'll close. Remember, Jesus mentioned about John the Baptist. There was not one, uh, the greatest born among women mm -hmm. was John the Baptist. And he's the what? Prophet. Mm -hmm. What did the Muslims say about their prophet? The greatest of all prophets. Mm -hmm. yeah. John the Baptist's job was what? For being a forerunner to Jesus Christ. Yeah. The false prophet... Being a forerunner to the Antichrist. Wow. But look at the timing here. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. So that's the false prophet. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Now look at his timing. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Who's that? That's the Antichrist. So notice that the Antichrist comes out first. I, don't, I have nowhere to draw now. Okay. I'll just draw on this devil's wing. All right. So the Antichrist comes out first. He comes out second. He comes out later. Now, some of you might say, why is that? Because isn't John the Baptist, if you look at your Bible, John the Baptist was born first. He was born first and he paved way for Jesus Christ first. Well, here's something interesting. If you believe in seven years of tribulation, the Antichrist is first, but remember he what? He dies. When he dies, what do you think the world's going to do? They need someone. Hence comes him. During the time of sorrow, grief, and their Savior has died, this guy finally comes to the scene. He comes as the comforter, like the Holy Ghost, the forerunner that Jesus Christ, he'll say this, like Jesus Christ or the people that you look up to, your Messiah, the God that you've been waiting for, the supernatural alien that you atheists could not believe in, but now you start to believe in now because science have pretty much proved it, you know, through your idols, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and all these guys that talk about these aliens coming down. Here he comes, your quote-unquote Jesus. How? I'm going, look, he's going to rise from the dead. Look at this. And then the Antichrist, boom, he resurrects from the dead and all the world bows down on their knees and say, this is the Messiah, this is God, this is Jesus. Wow. How about that? Maybe That's how he can be forerunner, is that he has, so he comes out after the Antichrist, there's no doubt, but he has to be a forerunner paving the way for him. How do you do that? Unless you get the Antichrist who ruled before, and then he, what? They have to look up to him, and then he's being the forerunner paving a way to Jesus Christ. Because remember, the world does not worship the Antichrist. He's conquering and to conquer. But his resurrection, 
death, burial, and resurrection will prove to the world he's God. He's Jesus Christ. How about that? Uh, did I mention a passage? I forgot. Or no. No, no passage. Okay. So we see over here the timing of the false prophet. So this is one of the most interesting characters that uh, I ever read. So then, in other words, it can come out like this. It could come out in a way where the false prophet, he just pops out of hell, just like the Antichrist, just pops out of nowhere with the spirit of Balaam within him. And he could be from the Syrian region, supposedly. Maybe coming from the Syrian uh, region, claiming Syrian nationality. So maybe he can mingle in with the people over there. And then perhaps while mingling with the people over there, because he can uh, con combine with the Christians, because there's so much conflict with Christians and Muslims, they need someone to bridge in the gap. Well, this Antichrist was already bridging in the gap, so then the false prophet is following the footsteps. And while the false prophet is following the footsteps and taking care of things during the Antichrist's death, the false prophet says, hey, look what I'm doing. I'm accomplishing these miracles in front of your eyes. And like John the Baptist, I'm paving the way for Jesus Christ. Watch. Your Jesus who died, buried, and resurrected, right? And boom, he resurrects. And then guess what? According to some of the Muslim sources, then you got their Jesus siding in with the Mahdi, Antichrist, and they two together can rule over the world and be able to take back the Dome of the Rock and Israel for themselves. And then the false prophet will enforce the religion through sword, by beheading, and by taking a mark that for uncanny just matches with the Arabic labels in the name of Allah. That's uh, my two cents on the false prophet. Let's close with a word of prayer. God, my Father, I pray that tonight's teachings were a blessing to the hearers, increase our knowledge of the scriptures, and then see a little bit more things that uh, your book is so amazing in revealing things that we've never seen before. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.